Hello, every Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Sounds really loud up here. Can you hear me way back there, though? Is it good? Okay. How's everyone doing today? Well, that's great to hear. Everyone seems super pumped up to learn about accounting and taxes. Yeah. Yeah. Woo. I love it. So real quick, just so you know who I am and why I might be a little qualified to talk about accounting. I own a business. I've owned a few different businesses over the years. And then I have a few plugins, the main one, Quiz and Survey Master. And then I'm the lead organizer of WordCamp Jacksonville, Florida. And I have a website and a Twitter, so if you ever want to look me up. Disclaimer, before I get into anything, I am not an accountant. Everything I'm going to talk about is experience and tips I've learned over the years from running several businesses, as well as consulting with my accountant. But I am not an accountant. So I just want to throw that out there. And then you should also consider booking time with an accountant, as they may be able to clarify some things, as well as find tips and best practices for your particular business. Any questions on the disclaimer before I proceed? OK. So the very first thing I want to talk about is knowing your business structure. Now, for a lot of people, they wait till the end of the year or at tax season, and they don't really have any business structure, so they didn't know exactly what they should be worrying about or what they should be keeping, what they should be holding on to, what could be deductible in their current business. So knowing your structure when you get started is probably very important in both a, in both a legal aspect as well as taxes. So the most common for people in this industry or freelancers or small agencies is usually either a sole proprietorship, an LLC, or an S-Corp. Anything above those and beyond that is probably a little bit outside the scope of most of the people here. So those are the three I'm going to talk about today. The sole proprietorship and LLC, there's a really big difference in the eyes of the law. But in taxes, they're the same exact thing. When you go to file your taxes, the LLC, sole proprietorship, they're pretty much identical. And you can file them almost the exact same way. They are both known as something called a pass-through entity. And essentially, all the money in your business account or any money, any income you come in, you get receive, it's pretty much treated as all your income. Whether if you have a separate business account and you keep the money in there and you only take out a small portion, it's still technically all your income because they're all pass-through entities. Now, the difference here with the S-Corp is that it's slightly different in that you are more of an employee and then the income business is slightly different than your personal income. So it helps with a tax break, but it's not super big tax break until you get past the $30,000 mark. So usually when I'm helping people get started and where they're going to start, I recommend starting with an LLC. And then once you pass 30,000, I suggest going to an S Corp for tax purposes. Obviously, consult your lawyer as well to see where you would best stand to start with. But for tax purposes, usually start with LOC, and then you transition to an S-Corp down the road. Does that make sense? Did I lose anybody? No? OK. So the next thing is all these forms and paperwork and stuff that no one wants to deal with. 1099, W-9, W-2. Those are all random forms. Most people have no idea what those are, and most of the time you probably won't deal with them. I will have the slides available afterwards for those who are trying to catch pictures. Uh-oh. Sean? Well, while Sean is fixing that, the first form is 1099. Essentially, this is what you'll use for your contractors, and then and vice versa, if you're being contracted to, the 1099 is the, the 1099 form. So if you make more than $600 from a client, usually they're going to ask for something called a W-9. And that's where you're going to fill out you know, this cool paperwork just saying who you are, blah, blah, blah. And then, did I have it back? No. I, OK. Anyways. So then the 1099 form is what says, hey, this is how much I've paid this person. So essentially, same thing on the opposite side. If you have a contractor, if you have lots of work, lots and lots, and you have hire on a designer 
or you bring on maybe a developer and you have some work to send to them, you would do this the opposite way. You would collect a W-9 from them and then issue them a 1099 if they have over $600 throughout that year. And then at the end of the year when they're doing taxes, they're going to use their 1099s and you'll use your 1099, 1099s to show how much income you've made through that avenue. Now, there's a few different ways you can keep up with your W-9s either. As you have contractors, you can ask for W-9 as soon as you bring them on, or once you get to the $600 mark. Personally, I'd rather just get the W-9 when I first bring them on, so I don't have to worry about tracking them down afterwards. Some contractors will disappear on you eventually. So if you were to contract out some design work and developer work, and then at the end of the year, remember you didn't collect the W-9 yet, and then try to hunt them down, it might be difficult. So usually I collect the W-9s right up front, but that's, that's just personal preference. And the W-2, it, for employees, you would issue out W-2s, and then contractors would be 1099s. But essentially, those two forms are the same thing. They're just pretty much saying how much you've paid them or how much someone's paid you if you're an employee or a contractor. Quarterly estimated taxes. A lot of people don't do this. I know I didn't to start with, but you really should. Essentially, the IRS expects any profitable business to make quarterly taxes. So, and a profitable is defined as making over $1,000 during the year. Most people, that'll be a client or two. So most people in this industry, once you start freelancing or doing agency work, you're going to be profitable enough that you're supposed to do this. However, now while they can, you can be penalized, if you're a small business, the penalty is usually very small. So that's why I didn't do it the first little bit, but you're supposed to. So, and there's a variety of ways you can do that, but usually it's essentially, um, say last year you made 30,000, hypothetically, so then this year you would make four equal payments of 7,500. So just as throughout the year, that's how you would estimate it until you get enough experience under your belt to kind of estimate how much you're going to be making this year. But most accountants recommend just taking how much you made last year and then splitting it up into quarters and then making that every quarter. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm, I meant, yeah, taxes on the 75. Yes, you're not going to be paying your entire income in the taxes you owe. Sorry, just to clarify. Track your income. I've helped a lot of freelancers over the years, and one thing I've found is that a lot of them don't really keep track of how much money they're owed or how much money is out there, what kind of income they're expecting. And that's not probably a good idea. You, you probably should know how much money is out there. I was helping a freelancer about a month ago who didn't, wasn't even sure which invoices they've sent out. So you, you can't make money if you don't send out invoices, first of all. But tracking your income is vital. So you can, one, see how much money you're expecting to come in, how much money you're making, where you're making that money from. Say you have a variety of different services you offer. By keeping track of this income, into, and you can categorize it, you can see which services are profitable, things along those lines. So it's pretty important to track your income. And then if you're tracking that, you want to keep all of the records accurate. So in this case, you want to stay on top of your books. And it can be time consuming depending on what you exactly do, what services you offer, what kind of payments you take. But for most people who are just taking maybe a client or two at a time, this won't really take that much time. So essentially, you want to log all your expenses and payments as they happen. Some people love to wait maybe once a month, once a week, once a quarter to go in and try to reconcile all their receipts and all their paid invoices. And that, once you get to that point, you, you'll be like, oh, OK, I have, to sit, I have to set aside six hours this coming Sunday. And then you're not going to want to do it, because no one wants to do accounting stuff for six hours. So if you do it as you go, you're more inclined to actually do it. Now, expenses to log. There's a lot, and this is not even an inclusive list, but this is most of the big ones for our industry. Purchases such as like computer, printer accessories, office supplies, your contractors. Obviously, you want to keep track of how much you're paying your contractors. Office, your co-working space, advertising, business cards, Facebook ads, Twitter ads, all of your legal, your lawyer stuff, all of those things, legal fees, mileage, gas, word camps. 
meals. Meals, for most meals, if it's business related and it's under $75, you don't have to keep the receipt, but you should. Because if you were to be audited by the IRS and you don't have your receipts, it's kind of hard to prove that it, was actually, it actually happened and all this fun stuff. So I, I keep all of my receipts that are business related, but technically under 75, you don't have to. It has to be business related with somebody, yes. Now, from there, over 75, then you have to have a receipt no matter what. But for most cases, I always keep the receipt just to have it. Clothing. A lot of people love to write off their suits or their you know, really dressed dress nice shirts and their dresses because they're going to go meet clients in these clothing. Technically, you can't. The clothing, if you can wear it in another setting, it's not technically required for your business. So this outfit, I cannot write off on my taxes. Now, if it had my company logo and I could only wear it at WordCamps or that scenario, then I could possibly write it off as taxes because I could, I could say that it's for business and I could usually only wear it when I'm trying to work some sort of business deal. Same thing, so similar avenues would be like a painter's outfit could only be done. Normally, most painters don't walk around in their painter's outfit at the grocery store. So those type of clothing could be written off, but the majority of everyday clothes, you don't usually get to write off. Use software. I've met a lot of people that try to manage this in Excel spreadsheets, and I get a headache just looking at how they do it. I, I don't know. These services make it super simple. So it's usually, and some of them, like Wave Accounting has a free plan. So I always suggest using a software because it'll help you categorize, it'll help you with invoicing, it'll help you with all these fun things instead of trying to deal with it all within Excel and yourself. I've used pretty much all of these. I like Wave Accounting because it's free, but I really like FreshBooks because it works really well with our industry, I think. And then Bench isn't a software per se. Um, it starts at $125 a month, but you get like a dedicated bookkeeper to keep track of everything for you that you consult with. So if you really don't like taxes or accounting or anything like that, I would suggest maybe looking into Bench or similar services. Use an online one, especially for our industry and just in general. You can get one that's maybe on your computer, like the QuickBooks computer edition. But in today's world, it's so much easier with the online. You can just give your accountant access or send them over the details to the reports rather than having to either print it out or email it over. It's just a lot easier in the online ones, in my experience. So you want to maintain your records. If you keep your receipts all year and then you throw them out at the end of the year and then IRS audits you the following year, you're not going to have those receipts anymore. So you want to keep those receipts and all of your documentation, usually seven years. If they decide to audit you, you will need to show documentation. So keep copies of invoices, receipts, statements, tax payments, et cetera, et cetera. Anything that goes into your taxes at the end of the year that you would, might need to show proof on. Sean. <laughs> so. Yeah, that was. Uh, Yeah. So I usually keep a filing cabinet. I have one at my desk at, the, at my home office, and I pretty much just keep all of my documentation for the business in that filing cabinet. At this point now, I have two filing cabinets, but it's usually best practice just to keep all your documentation in one place, and that way you have it. Yeah, as long as you have the documentation. A lot of receipts... A lot of receipts will fade over time, so you should make a scan copy, especially uh, some of the grocery store ones, so that paper that will fade within like three weeks. So always make a scan copy regardless. I try to keep the originals, but if they fade over time, it's not going to really. What he's saying is he believes that you should either do all scanned or none scanned. In my experience, I've never encountered that you have to go one way or the other. But again, that's how I've worked with my accountant, so it might... I'm not the most expert to know the exact situation there. I know I don't have everything scanned. I only have some of it. 
and my accountant doesn't get on to me. I'm no expert, but that's, I just know what my accountant and I have worked through. That's fine. I'll, I'll just keep going. So. Now, the next thing is you want to report every penny. I know a lot of people, that, they get a lot of 1099s in. They're like, well, the IRS won't notice if I don't report this 1099 of $1,000. So they might not notice this. I don't want to pay them that much taxes. Don't try to get around the IRS. The IRS will always find out, and it won't end well, ever. So always report, report every penny. Report all sources of income. And then, because IRS will actually compare your client's tax information, so those that collected your W-9 and, and they're sending out 1099s, the IRS is going to check all that and be like, wait, you know, company A paid Joe $100 or $1,000 or $10,000, and it's not lining up over here. So the IRS can actually send you something called a Notice CP2000, which is a Notice of, under, of Underreported Income. And they will send you that. If they catch you, they will send you that document. And it can lead to penalty, lawsuit, or jail. So it's not fun. Don't, don't go down that road, route. Don't try to go around the IRS. I thought he was fixing it, but he just went outside. <laughs> That's fine. Any questions on anything I've gone over so far before? I don't have the answer for that. I I know we. I've, my accountant helps me with most, some of this, so. <laughs> Those forms, I'm not the, I don't know, I have enough knowledge about to be confident to tell you one way or the other. I could tell you how I, mine is. I have some, my accountant kind of works through and has some dollar amounts that she looks at, but I'm not an expert enough that I would want to tell you one way or the other. That'd be a question for your accountant. Oh, that's, that's... Any other questions on anything we've gone over so far? Was it that boring that you're all asleep? I know, I know taxes are pretty boring. I... So th these are two great questions for your lawyer and your accountant, because there's a lot of variables in this question. But I, I would start as an LLC, because you want to keep your personal and your business separate and have all those great advantages of having it separate. And then you switch to S Corp. Once you get around 30000 is what my accountant said when we were reviewing this, mainly because the tax breaks aren't usually really much before that. So she said, you, once you hit 30000 and over, that's when she suggests to most of her clients. That's when I switched to an S-Corp, and that's when she suggests most people did well. Does that answer your question? You want to repeat your question? So from like a sole proprietorship and why you would want to switch, that's more of a legal question. But essentially, if you get sued and you're separated, you're just you, they can go after your personal assets, like your house, your car, all that stuff that you don't want to lose. So by working with your lawyer and establishing an identity, like an LLC or S Corp, C Corp, you'll keep it separate. And especially in this industry, you, would let, you probably want to keep those things separated. Does that, does that answer your question? The, the tax advantages. It would be the main reason that most of, between an LLC and S Corp, most of the legal aspects are the same. I'm no legal expert. There are, there are some distinctions. But in my experience from the things I've switched over, it hasn't really done anything. To, the tax advantages were the main reason I switched. Yeah, in, in my experience with my businesses and then what my accountant suggested is usually the thirty, forty thousand range is when we start looking into those. There's a special form that my accountant fills out. I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but it's, it's a fairly simple process. You have to go through a certain process to do it, but it's, there's no set date that you'd have to do it. 
This is more of an accounting talk, so I don't, I'm not nearly an expert in legal. I'm definitely not an expert in accounting, but I'm f much farther away from lawyer. But um, there's a variety of ways you could turn, go into an LLC. You can go like an online route, like LegalZoom. You can go meet a lawyer in person. There's a lot of varieties. I always suggest that this is your first business to go talk to a lawyer. That way you're making sure you have all your I's dotted and your T's crossed. But that's, com that's completely personal preference there. Does that answer your question? I guess that was my last slide. So any other questions? I have not found any dis disadvantage. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not an expert here, but in my experience, there's not a business. I just didn't know about them when I started the co my companies. So that's why I started with LLC. Not at my level, at least not according to my lawyer. Hopefully he's right. But uh, there, there's some more legal aspects to it. We have some other entities. I'm more of like an employee, and I like these tax-free dividends, all those fun complications. Uh, but it's, it's not quite the C-Corp level. But, and every, every state's different. Every like, county's different. So that you want to consult with your lawyer. And I'm not an expert, but it, not in mine. Well, if it's under 600, you don't have to. You can still report it. It's, it's not required, but it's very strongly suggested. And if you can't hunt it down, then mention it to your accountant, and then they have these special forms that they can issue and send to your clients. But it's, as long as you're reporting the income, and that would fall back more on them if they're not doing their side. Yes? If, are you talking about quarterly estimated payments? If this is your very first year and you're just starting, you have no clients from last year, then you don't usually have to worry about it this first year because you're not technically a profitable uh, as of last year. So this is a new cycle, so you're not, you don't have a defined profitable entity until the end of the year, and that's when you would start making estimated court. Now, if you estimate a lot, if you start having a lot of clients right out of the gate, then you can go ahead and start making estimated based on your traction now. But if not, then you can wait to the end of the year because, like I said, at our small levels, the penalty is not usually hu huge, but they usually give you some leeway, especially like if it's your first year, then you don't have to worry about it right out of the gate. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions on the exciting topic of accounting and taxes? And I will tweet out uh, on my Twitter a, sli a link to the slides if anyone's interested in that. And then everyone else have a great day. Thank you.